you have to know yourself. Challenging yourself is knowing yourself. When they step out of a comfortable job and they start up their company, it doesn't go well. And they figure out, actually, being in a big corporation was better for me because you may be very brilliant, you may be very talented, but you may not be good at managing. Are you ready to transform your life? This is a no-nonsense show helping immigrants like you create generational wealth, even while working full-time. Get ready to take notes. Here's your host, Socket Jane. My great to us listeners, if you want to manage real estate, maybe you're ready for a lifestyle change. By selling your real estate, of course, you may have to pay substantial cap and gain taxes. One option that may help solve this is to learn about doing a 1031 tax deferred real estate exchange. Because you may be able to defer all of the capital gain taxes, and you could even exchange into a replacement property that may allow you to get rid of all of the headaches involved with being an active landlord. Ray DeWitt is a managing director with Bangtanger Financial Services, and his goal is to help you understand all the rules associated with the 1031 exchanges. To learn more, visit their website at bangtangerfinancial.com and browse the library of education material. Please be sure to see the disclosures and show notes. Welcome back, my great to wealth listeners. Today, we have somebody with us by the name Steve Hoffman. He is dialing from Davis, California. It's an amazing human being, very successful, and in a space that we actually have never brought a guest of that nature before. He is an author, international best-selling author. He is an innovator himself. He helps innovators be successful. And his most recent book is called Surviving a Startup. We just thought that it would be interesting because I'm always interested in how people make a shift from their current mindset to the new mindset, right? When you're becoming a founder, either you started your life as a founder or you were working on a nine-to-five job, a traditional corporate job, and you were switching a job or switching to become an entrepreneur is a mental barrier. There's a chasm that you have to cross. And Steve, working with so many of the entrepreneurs, so many of the founders, thought it would be great to get him in here to start looking at a mindset of an entrepreneur and what it needs to be, and then draw parallels from there for anyone in any phase of their life who's looking to migrate into a different type of a life. Steve, with that said, thank you again for joining the show. Appreciate it, buddy. It's fantastic to be here. Oh, thank you. I'm always looking for, I have a deep connection with tech. As, as I was telling you, I was at Airbnb for five years. I missed that vibe. I missed that rigor. I missed that creativity. Not that it's not there, but it's just very concentrated in the valley. So you're in the heart of it. Steve, before we get into what you do and how you do it and what made you do it, we will always like to open the show as when you heard the word migrate to wealth, what was going through your head? So migrate to wealth. So I always say the greatest talent always migrates to the greatest opportunity. So Love you migrate that. to wealth, it, you move towards opportunity. And that opportunity can be within the current location you are, or it can be yeah. around the world. You look at the smart, driven, ambitious, talented people, they are on the move. They are looking for those opportunities. Right. And they're the type because of their core nature, they will take the risk to actually Correct. leave wherever they are, whatever they're doing, and go there. Yeah, it's kind of interesting, Steve. You said that, I hear that, and I know that, risk. Is migration, is there risk involved in migration? Or there is the mental model is shifting? Because, you know, most of us, I migrated from India. It was risky, but it was not really risky because somebody else had already migrated from India, right? Kind of like, how do you look at risk when you're looking at risk? Well, there's different types of risk. So there's the risk of the unknown. Like you're comfortable True. You're where you are. True. You know, you have your family True. around, you know how things operate, you understand it. When you move to a new environment, a new job or a new opportunity, or you branch off and start your own company, there's always all these unknowns. And unknowns tend to scare people. They True. are risks. So it's not yeah. just monetary risk. Fair um, point. Sometimes it is, right? So if you have a job secured, migration to a new country is less risky. Or if you have a place at a a prestigious university, you figure you're on a good track. But if you leave a great paying job and branch off and start your own company, very risky, right? Both monetarily, but also you're venturing into territory you just haven't been before. You don't completely understand. And I work with people like this all the time. Like a founder space is actually built its reputation off overseas founders. Yeah. So a lot of people don't understand this, but in Silicon Valley, where I'm from, I'm not far from San Francisco. Yeah. In Silicon Valley, over half the entrepreneurs who found these amazing venture funded companies that become unicorns 
over half of them are from overseas. That's so true. They're not American. So yeah. That's because we're a magnet for talent from all over the world. Silicon Valley isn't, you go around Silicon Valley, which is my home basically, and over half the people in every room you go to in every networking event or any corporation, over half the people were not born in the United States. Definitely. A conglomeration of people from all over the world. And they are all, like you say, the ones who are most successful have a certain mindset. And they, it's usually a mindset where they are willing to take those bigger risks. I hope it picks up eventually migrant thinking, right? I yes. think it's a mindset of a migrant, which is coming from they're ready to disrupt their current mental model to figure out what they have no idea what the new mental model is going to look like. They have no idea. There's an excitement, but there's a fear. There's love of the new opportunity, but there's a concern of their safety and security. And when I say that, not physical security, but more about financial and there's no support system and everything else. It's anything you want to do. You know how Carol Dalt came about the mindset of fixed and the fixed mindset and the growth mindset. I really think the migrant thinking is more closer to the growth mindset than any other way of looking because you're always shifting your reality. And when your reality gets shifted, when your comfort zone gets altered and there is no foundation to depend on, you become more open. Migrants have had to immerse themselves in a whole new culture, a whole new way of thinking. That process of literally just being a migrant opens up their mind. And I've also noticed something else about migrants <laughs> and why America, America has been built on immigrants. Definitely. <laughs> Just, definitely. You look at, you know, the number of industries that were basically founded and grown by first generation immigrants and second generation immigrants. It's yeah. like most of our great companies, like the right. majority of our great companies were built by migrants. And the reason this is so important. There's a couple things. One, uh, migrants had to go through this process. First of all, there was a filtering process. Let's face Correct. it. There are billions of people in the world, but not billions of people migrate to the US. So what you get is you get a filtering of the most persistent, ambitious people who are really hungry to do something. Right. Like they could right. do something back home, but they want to do something bigger. And so that filter, you're getting this group of people entering the US who are willing to take the risk, are hungry and are willing to put in the hard work, the huge number yeah. of hours it takes to get to their goal, to get to their dream. And so when you get migrants in the US, you're getting a very select group of people actually who are in a really interesting position. They have an interesting mindset because on one hand, migrants, they want to change their life. They want to mm -hmm. fundamentally make their life better. That's why they're migrating. If they didn't, <laughs> if they were satisfied yeah. with what they had, why migrate? They don't need right? to. They're, they don't need right? to. Unless uh, you're starving, right? You wouldn't migrate. But you know, right. if you're comfortable where you are, why not stay? So that's one thing. When they get here, they're also immersed not just with American culture, but with culture from all over the world. Because all of our cities are melting pots of people and ideas. They're being challenged in all these different ways to think all these different ways which is really important in the creative process and business forming process. And then number three, which I think is kind of really important, Americans, the ones who are here, right? You wonder like how can half the amazing tech startups out of Silicon Valley have migrant founders, right? How is this possible? And well, a lot of people here get complacent. They kind of have expectations that they should be handed something, think they should work as hard. People come, from overseas, they're willing to work hard. They're willing to go through pain to get what they want. Uh, whereas a lot of people born here, they don't have, some do, right? But it's a lower percentage. So it's a much higher percentage. It's actually the majority of migrants yeah. are willing to do that. No, you're right. I see that in my life because I'm married to a first generation. I migrated about, immigrated here about 23 years ago. And my wife and I were always having a conversation. She's like, why are you always looking for something new, right? Kind of like right. something more challenging. I'm like, <laughs> you know what? It's a good question. One way to look at this is, am I ever going to be satisfied? Or is the path, I'm, I think she's looking from a spiritual aspect of it, the fulfillment you're looking for, you're not going to find an outside, right? I was thinking about it the other day. I'm like, I actually did, to your point, I didn't leave India to build a comfortable life. I built India to make something out of me. That's I had a very life. comfortable life there. I mean, I had somebody helping in the house chores. I didn't have to wash dishes. I don't have to drive my car. It was great. Life was great. And it would have become better as I started to make money there. But something else drove me here, which was 
the thrill of finding an opportunity and creating something, right? No, I do want to challenge yourself. Challenging, challenging yourself. yourself. Can you do this? Can you be one of those people who makes it? Correct, correct, correct. And I remember I started this podcast back in October of last year. I was way beyond my comfort zone. Most of the audience know it, at least our consistent listeners. I was not comfortable with how I sounded. It doesn't matter how good or bad. People kept telling me there's nothing wrong. I'm like, I am not comfortable, right? The only way I could get beyond that, I'm like, when I left India, I couldn't even speak English. I understood English. I'm in a better spot 23 years from that time. So, you know what? Let's see what happens. The curiosity fuels me. I'm like, you know, I'm just going to launch it. If one person listens it, it's done its job. And then that's well, good. And of you, course, you sound great. You have a great presence, a great man. Well, thank you. And I'm not thank just you, saying Steve. that. I mean, I think all your listeners know that. That's why they do. No, in. thank you. And you do seem very comfortable. So, you did overcome that. You know, we all have these areas where we could improve. Definitely. But yeah. A lot of people would say, oh, that's not me. I could never do a podcast and they wouldn't do it. Right. That's the part. Now, what happens there is, Steve, I want to talk to you about one thing. I think we were talking about this off fair. So let's take an example. I'll take me as an example, right? I come from India. I went to the best colleges here. I get to a company like Google. We use Google as an example. It's Google is not the only company. Google is an example. And Google hires me and it pays me six, seven, eight hundred K a year. Eventually, I get to that point. Now I'm very comfortable, at least financially, I'm very comfortable. I'm top 1% of the America at that point. But I know I'm unhappy because now the complacency that I left back home is again settling in, right? Because I'm comfortable. I get up at 10 or 11 in the morning. I do my work in two, three, four hours because I'm smart. And this is not just me. This is a typical tech immigrant who is in most of these big companies is getting there where I'm like, I get fed at at my office, I get my laundry done in my office, I have no issues in my life, right? Financially. But there's something is blocking me. Something is preventing me to move forward. What happens there? What happens there? Why did we become that way? And I have my answer. I would love to, because you probably have a generalized answer because your sampling pool is much larger than just looking at me. So why is that happening? Is it because we didn't think about what good life means to us and all it meant was money and now we have got the money and now we're thinking, oh, we got the money. We came here for money. We got it. So check the box. We won. And now this is my new standard, which is just cruise. What happens there? So I work with entrepreneurs all the time from all over. Many of them who have are immigrant op- entrepreneurs who are leaving companies like Google, right. like Facebook, like Microsoft to actually start their, they're taking a huge risk. And I was mm-hmm. like, why would you leave a job like that? It's so right. Com- That's kind of interesting. So, yeah. Like, you're cruising there. Like in, I wrote a book, Surviving a Startup, which is, I called it Surviving a Startup because it's brutal. Like It's brutal. It's, it is brutal. So you're, you're yeah. leaving a great job, great paying to do something incredible where the odds are one in 10 that you will even survive. Right. And did you know, like only 1% of startups become unicorns. So that, yeah. And these are startups that actually get angel funding and get money. Not counting all the people who just have ideas and try something. Correct. 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 So 1% of those that actually raise money get to be unicorns. Your odds are low, right? (laughs) And here you're sitting on a super cushy, job where you don't even have to try to do well. You'll retire with more money than you could spend. Correct. So why would you leave this? The answer is, who are we, right? We are what we do in our lifetime. Like right. that is what we are. And if we are just doing the same thing and it's super easy, the pro- thing is being alive. We never really know who we are fully, right? We are always in the process of discovering. And how do we discover who we are? Well, we discover who we are by what we do in this world. And so we like think I may be capable of doing something more than I'm doing uh-huh. now, but you'll never know unless you try. If you don't try, you won't know. So if you sit at this job, yes, you're going to have a much bigger bank account for mm-hmm. sure when you retire than you have now. But maybe you already have enough money now. <laughs> so you're going to spend the next 20 years of your life just riding it out until you're old and never discover who you really are or what you were capable of, what you could really do in this world. I think for a lot of people, especially ambitious people, that's not enough for them. 
you look at all the great people who make great change in this world, like whether it's great social change, whether it's they're writing books, whether right. they are founding companies, they are pushing themselves. They are taking unnecessary risks, right? What is a necessary risk? Well, a necessary risk is you need to do this to survive. If you are right. already comfortable, Correct. you don't need to do it to survive. So every other risk you add on top of that is an unnecessary risk. It may be unnecessary for you to survive, but it may be necessary in order for you to go on a journey and really figure out who you are, what you're capable of, and in the essence, create meaning in your life, right? We yeah. want to create meaning because at the end of the day, you can have an enormous bank account that you can leave behind when you die, like <laughs> to your family, your kids, whatever. Yeah. But after a while, how much money can you can give them and how much money is it even good to give somebody, right? <laughs> you know, yeah, you know, that's true. Should, your kids should earn their own money. They should go on their yeah. own journey. So. This is your chance to really do something in life and is what you want to say to yourself when you're older is, oh, I had a comfortable life or I had a life that was really meaningful, that was really challenging, where I really discovered and did so many things I didn't even think were possible. I would rather right. say the latter. I would completely agree. And of course, you're a writer, right? So you could see that the way I have never heard anyone describe risk the way you describe necessary and unnecessary right and that i think sums a lot of it is and you going from me moving from india was not a necessary risk it was an unnecessary yeah. risk people leaving google microsoft airbnbs and companies like that it's not a necessary risk because they could survive there and be there for the rest of their lives performing probably not at the best capacity, but even the either subtimal is even higher than a standard operations anyways. But the problem is, I think at that point, what you're saying is right. What you're saying is, who am I? Am I this person who's just getting up at 10 in the morning and lazing around working for three, four, five hours a day, which you're not even mentally engaged? You're not physically engaged, mentally engaged, emotionally engaged, spiritually you engaged. Don't have, you don't have a lot at stake. Right. You don't. Because you're not risking a lot. And so it's not really challenging you in the way when you have a lot at stake, you discover yeah. who you really are. You know, you discover yeah. when you're making certain investments and that <clears throat> investment, you look at the great entrepreneurs out there like Phil Knight from Nike. Literally, there are so many times during Nike's. I don't know if there's a book called Shoe Dog, which is great for every. Yeah, I would just watched a documentary on air recently. Yeah, uh, yeah it was interesting. Yeah. Yeah, every time he'd risk it all. Like literally every month he right. was pushing to grow his business, there was a good chance he wouldn't make payroll that month <laughs> because, right. because he right. kept pushing the growth. And you look at great entrepreneurs across the board, they are doing that. Why are they doing it? They're not just doing it to grow a business. They are doing it because that's who they are. That's in the core of who they are. It wouldn't be who they are if they didn't take those risks. So Steve, can anyone become that person, right? So I think there's one is the conversation. I don't want to say, are they born that way or not? Of course, their life shaped them to that way. But is there a way, and this is not a knock on second, third generation Americans, it's not. But let's say, hypothetically, what we're saying is the first generation immigrants or the new immigrants are much more driven to challenge themselves. Yeah, and, and like I said, it's a filtering process. Like not, filtering process. you know. It's not like everybody from India came over here like you did, right? There's a lot of people, if they all came over, I don't think we'll have enough place to live. So. <laughs> but what I'm saying is you're one of a select group of people, right? Self-selected. Yeah. You selected yourself to come over here because you had more of that mentality. Can anybody do it? Well, I write about this too in my books because I think it's really important. It's not for everybody. There mm. are certain people, you know, you have to know yourself. And part right. of this challenging yourself is knowing yourself. And a lot of people right. find out when they, let's say, step out of a comfortable job and they start up their company, it doesn't go well. And they figure out, they yeah. find out, actually, being in a big corporation was better for me because you may be very brilliant, you may be very talented, but you may not be good at managing people. Correct. You may not be good at managing stress in your life. Right. You may right. have issues with your family like other members of your family, you're not alone when you do these things. There, certain people can handle high degrees of uncertainty much better than others. So True. you True. really have to know, am I a person who needs stability? If I am in an unstable position, does it psychologically affect me in a very negative way? If that's mm -hmm. the case, 
probably you shouldn't maximize your risk because True. you will find out that you aren't suitable for that. Other people can handle change. In fact, they love change. They right. love the adrenaline of uncertainty. They love not knowing what's coming next and Correct. having constantly new challenges. Those people with that mindset and that genetic makeup, and that's who they are, that's in their DNA, they are much better suited to take on challenges like being an entrepreneur, like leaving a very comfy job. So yeah. really, it's understanding question of who you are DNA wise, like what you like, and then also what your talents are, right? Because yeah. you could be a really awesome coder, but you could be the most God awful manager of your own company. <laughs> well, I've seen those people. <laughs> <laughs> Which means that if you do a startup, somebody else should correct. be CEO. Maybe correct, you correct. could be on the technical side, but you really have to know where yeah. you fit in and where you can contribute the most. And a lot where all of us are to some degree, a uh, self delusional, like we believe we can do things that we can't because we want to believe that but right at a certain point it's really good to test yourself and find out what you're capable of and like you said a lot of us there is room there is flexibility it's not like hard coding like you became better at doing podcasts now you're really good definitely right? because you, yeah you took that challenge if we work at it we can push our limits it's like sports like some people are born with the athletic uh, body yeah. the height the strength, the dexterity yeah. of an NBA star. They're born with that, but maybe they're lazy. <laughs> they don't have the possible, or yeah. you know, they aren't going to push themselves. Those people will never make it to the NBA. Correct. Other right. people may be as determined as anything, but they're short. <laughs> they're just never going to be an NBA star, right? They true, just don't true, have the true. Physical. And then there's this people like most of us who are in this gray area. Like yeah. we are neither like born to it. <laughs> right but if we work extremely hard given the abilities we have we we'll have get a there. shot at it yeah we we have a shot at making it and that is the majority of people so steve let's actually take it from a different side so um do you have kids yeah perfect yeah let's take it from the kids aspect right because i think part of that is your risk tolerance as our risk tolerance as an adult gets shaped very early in our life, right? I mean, a child by default is born to take on risk because they're walking, they're falling. So they're comfortable taking the risk, right? It's not like they're saying, no, I'm going to fall, so I'm not going to walk. No child, at least I haven't encountered any child who doesn't do that. And no parent says, you're going to fall, so don't walk. They're like, let them fall, but in a controlled manner so that they can continue walking. Because the skills that we're talking about as an entrepreneur, as an immigrant, these are all important skills in life. Even though you don't launch the next Airbnb or the Google or the Facebook of the world, those skills are going to make you a better human being. You're going to be living a life on your terms. You're doing things because you want to do it, not because somebody else is pushing it on you. Because most of us are living life of lies. We're unhappy with the person we married to with the company we're working in, but we are stuck in a societal construct. They were like, this is our norm. This is it. Let me just accept it and move on and then eventually die. I'm generalizing and I'm abstracting. It's not that simple. But then if you're thinking about these migrant thinking, these entrepreneurial thinking, the way they think, is there a way to transfer that to our kids? And I'm personally invested in it because I have a seven and nine-year-old daughter, two daughters who are seven and nine-year-old. I'm like, okay, what can we do as parents to make sure that they're comfortable taking on challenges, they're comfortable taking on risk, they're okay failing, right? Because those are some of the traits. Yeah, it's really <clears throat> an interesting question. So I want to go back to your first statement. Children, they walk because they aren't afraid and they'll take that chance. It's not as true as mm. you think it is. I'll tell you from personal, I have two kids. So one kid started walking right away. He was just like up and walking on the younger child. He figured out how not to walk. And he became so good at scooting on his butt, like with his hands. Right. And he would never walk. Like this right. kid is just not, their temperaments are very different. One, mm. the older child is much more adventurous, much more willing to take risks. The younger child is not a born risk taker. And we could see that growing up from the time that they were walking. So like not every kids do learn to walk because it's more efficient right. at the end once right. they learn, but they don't do it at the same speed or in the same way. Mm. Um, human beings are the same way. So when you look at your kids, first of all, 
you got to look at who they really are. Like we all want to mold our kids, but their kids might not be like us. Like you came, you took the chance. You, you know, your parents didn't force you to come here. Hopefully (laughs) economic situation. Some people's economic, they have to come They're political refugees, they're economic refugees, whatever. They're forced to come. They're kids from Honduras who are fleeing, you know, horrible yeah. lives who are forced to come. For them, it's much less risk coming here. <laughs> but uh, Correct. you didn't. Correct. You came of your own volition. Your kids may not have that same DNA. Well, they have a DNA, but it goes throughout your whole family Correct. history, right? Your Correct. ancestry, right? So they are not you. And this is one thing you have to discover. I look at my kids and I was like, I had to recognize early on, they are not me. Like I, a little crazier, much bigger risk taker, either of my children. So I think the most important thing you can do, and this is my firm belief as a parent, is not to expect your kids to be like you, to be open to discovering who they are and to be open to giving them the choice to decide how they want to become and what they want to do with their lives. And it may be totally different than the choices you make. And honestly, if you support them and try to understand them and let them do what they do, you and them will be much happier. <laughs> so, true, you know, true. Because there are many ways to live our life, right? You and I chose very similar paths, right? And probably your listeners here are kind of more like us because that's Correct. why they're listening to this. Correct. So with my kids, and they just got their first jobs. So they're nice. Congratulations. I'm very ambitious. I wanted them to do certain things. And I always wanted them to seek out knowledge, learn more, challenge themselves more, do more. And I see it, especially I have some of my good friends are, you know, immigrants and they are really pushing their kids. You know, (laughs) I have one who's like, who, like the question you just asked, he lives with every day. He's like, I want my kids to challenge themselves. I want them to do more. And he's always pushing his kids because that's his mindset. I took a very different approach because at the end of the day, I always think they may do stuff to please you, but then it's not who they are, right? They're not doing it for themselves. Correct. And I came to the conclusion that my kids, if they are going to take big risks, they do it and challenge themselves and become something much bigger than they are. They have to do that for themselves at the end of the day. Correct. If they're doing it for somebody else at a certain point, they're going to fail. Because they're it's true. not true to who they are, or they're not going to be happy because yeah. they aren't discovering who they are and what they want to do with their lives. So I told them, just do your best in school, learn whatever you learn, and whatever college you get into is fine. Like, yeah. I do not care. And then I would tell them, I kind of went off on my own weird journey. Like, I'm a big risk taker. So I study electrical computer engineer. I found out no, that's going to be a boring life. I don't want to just sit in an office, maybe, yeah. you know, working for a big corporation, being a computer engineer. And so I went to film and television for grad school. And then I worked in Hollywood. Sweet. TV tech, Love it. And then I went to Japan to make games. And then I came back to Silicon Valley to launch my first game startup. And then I just kept going on all these crazy paths because that's me. But, you know, I look at my kids and they're very, very different. They ended up doing really well like really amazingly well. They went, ended up getting into top tier schools and then they got amazing jobs. But I purposely had to try to restrain myself because right. I'm kind of like you, like I really wanted my kids to do more. <laughs> but I found when in restraining myself and just appreciating them and what they were doing and the choices they were making, yeah. it made them so much happier and it made them secure. And I look at them now and they are so happy. Like they, that's all that matters. Like many of your listeners here, they ended up getting high tech jobs, right? Right. Because we're kind of in the high tech world and they have high tech parents. (laughs) So (laughs) they're earning great money. They haven't taken the leap yet to be entrepreneurs. I am not pushing them because this is, they have to. Their journey. It's their journey. Yeah. Their journey. I always valued education, valued, told them that learning and hard work are the most important things. Right. that's different than actually pushing them. Like, did you do this? Did you get an A? Did you get your homework? Right. If you don't get it into an Ivy League school, you know, you're doomed. If you put that, I think that's negative pressure. I and, think so too. I think so. I agree. Yeah. I agree with 100%. So that's my philosophy. Just that's my philosophy. No, I think it's an important philosophy, right? But I think in your point, what you're doing is you're not pushing them to do anything, but you're an example for them. 
right? If I this have- is how someone looks like if they take a risk. If ever they have to do that, they have a mental model now. The thing is going to be, which I agree with you, and I appreciate that, because what you're not doing is you're not living an unhappy life. You found your happiness and your happiness in doing crazy things that you've done, which is perfectly fine for you, but it was done at, on your own terms. That's what we're talking about. It's you figured out what works for you. My brother from the same genetic pool is exactly the opposite of me. Mm. <laughs> wants zero risk in his life. He, right. You took all the risk for the entire family, man. <laughs> he, he works as a coder for a large bank and literally yeah. wants his life the same every day. He w- goes on the same vacations every year to the same places. <laughs> wow, man. He does yeah. not want change. He like So my kids and my brothers doesn't have kids. So my kids are sort of, he's like the second father to them. So yeah. two examples. Like, <laughs> They have made, it's a great, it's actually amazing. Crazy risk and every year doing something new. And then they have my yeah. brother who literally <clears throat> doesn't want any change in his life. <laughs> Zero. That is so interesting. So I think it's happy, an age. We're happy in different ways, right? It's not an age. It's like genetics. Literally his genetics are somewhat different than mine. And his risk tolerance is much, much lower than mine. Correct. Correct. And his ambitions <clears throat> are much, much lower than mine. But he is very happy with the choices he made for himself. See, and as I'm long as he's scared. living that life, it's okay. Now, if he was unhappy living that life, that's really where the concern starts to happen, right? That you're unhappy in the person you are with the life you're living. There's something beyond that. And then how so, can you push yourself at that point? Right. I think it's knowing you, who you are. Knowing who you, you are. Want, yeah. What makes you happy in your life. And everybody has to know these things. And I think... Kids need to discover what makes them happy, not what makes their parents happy. So, Steve, let's talk about that. That's a very important. You don't know that part of my life. I actually lived with monks in India for about two and a half years. Really? Trying to rediscover myself, right? Trying to find me who I am. But not everyone's going to do that. Not everyone's going to do that. That's not for everyone. I'm just like you in that regard, just crazy stuff. I think I get up in the morning, what's the crazy I can do today? How much crazier can I be today? Exactly. Which is what I love. I've changed 25 addresses in the 23 years I've lived in this country. So I like change inherently. So I think where I was going with that was self-awareness is key, right? Because self-awareness is the most important thing for you want to be adventurous or not. How do you become self-aware? Do you have any thoughts and recommendations on, because even your entrepreneurs that you're working with, starting anything is very simple, right? I could start a new company tomorrow. That's not a hard part. The hardest part is sticking with it and seeing it through, at least to the extent where your idea, you still believe in the idea, right? You still believe in yourself. How do you work on the self-awareness piece? So self-awareness takes time. Self-awareness takes work. You don't become self-aware just by doing the same thing over and over. (laughs) You become self-aware by actually analyzing the decisions you make, Mm -hmm. trying to really figure out why you made those decisions. And for a lot of people, we're all on this journey in life. We're all self-aware to a certain degree. Some people are much more aware of, in an accurate way, of why they're making the decisions they make. So all of us tell ourselves a narrative. We tell ourselves a story in our head, a story Mm -hmm. about who we are, what our life means, why we make these decisions. Often those stories aren't entirely true because the stories themselves are a lot of times built to defend us from discovering things about us that we don't want to know. Yeah, yeah. You know, there, there are truths about ourselves often about our lives that we don't want to admit because we don't have the framework to process them like Correct. to admit our own weaknesses to admit our own things about ourselves that are unpleasant and to admit things about the world that are unpleasant or scary or you know not the way we want them to be so this each <clears throat> what you asked is an extremely difficult question to answer and there are many paths to doing it like you went and lived with monks right and discovered a probably a part of yourself or pieces yeah. of yourself that you would have never discovered without that experience correct ever. so just the fact that you did that makes you more self-aware there's so many great things from hinduism from buddhism from all the world's religions that can teach us 
There are things from psychology that can teach us. And there are things from our own experience and relationship to other people that can teach us. So one of the things that I do know is that we only know ourselves. This is my belief, and it may not correspond to other people. We only know ourselves as the reflections of ourselves in the world around us. And by the reflections of ourselves in the world around us, I mean, when we interact with other people, how they react to us is how we affirm or who we are, right? And who, who mm. we think we are, or we're challenged. So yeah. by the release, a lot of people block off relationships, whether it's relationships with a loved one, uh, they refuse to talk about certain things because they don't yeah. want to know. Correct. They don't really want to go there, right? They don't want to go to painful parts of their past, painful things right. about the world or their relationship with other people. But that is how we discover who we are by going to those places and really honestly talking with people, honestly listening to what they're saying to us, mm -hmm. not filtering. We all have our biases. We're always right. filtering all the information that comes in with our life experience to honestly go out there and actually analyze what we've done, what it means, what it really says about us. And this can be through things, through starting a new company, like we're talking about branching off yeah. and being an entrepreneur. It can be even things in your current job. You don't have to leave your job to discover much more about yourself. It's definitely things about how you interact with your kids, how you interact with your spouse, how you interact with your parents and your closest friends. Do you really go deep with them? Most people don't. They're just doing surface level talk. Yeah. Like, can you go deeper? Can you really go to your spouse or your parents and ask them, who do you think I really am? How would you describe me? What do you think are my weaknesses? What do you think are my strengths? And be honest with me. Don't sugarcoat it. I want to know to go to live with monks and see how they go through meditation, meditation, clearing your mind. Yeah. Go to therapy. You can do therapy in many different ways. You can go <clears throat> to a psychiatrist or a psychologist and traditional therapy, you know, would be talking about yourself, right? You learn yeah. a lot just talking to yourself, right? What are those conversations sometimes, but talking to yourself in front of somebody else, you will say other things, especially if they ask you hard questions Correct. about Correct. that you wouldn't ask yourself. So a lot of people learn there's so many different ways and people are not one thing. The thing is, and I may be talking too long, but all of us are filled with contradictions. We like to simplify ourselves, but humans are incredibly complex. We have good pieces about us. We have bad pieces about us. We have altruistic pieces and really giving pieces. We have selfish pieces. You, one person, we are not black or white. We are a mixture of all these different emotions and things in different situations bring out different things in us. And this is really important to understand if you're going to understand yourself. If you try to simplify yourself too much, you are just living in a delusion <laughs> that you are creating. Sometimes these can be very positive, right? A lot of the best entrepreneurs, they say, are overly <clears throat> optimistic. They believe yeah. in themselves so much that it's unrealistic. But because they do, they're able to do things they wouldn't be able to do otherwise. So right. necessarily knowing who you really are uh, doesn't always get you what you really want, <laughs> unless what you yeah. really want is to know who you really are. <laughs> so. It's kind of funny. And you were not talking too much. I think it's all relevant. I think it's good. It's yeah. really, I remember me as, as a young person, uh, I'm getting older, definitely. But yeah. somebody asked me once, the great mentor of mine is like, why don't you do introspection? He said, because I won't like the answers. I only know it. I don't like those answers. So why would I ask the question that I don't like the answers? At that time, I don't even think I knew what I was saying. I genuinely didn't. But I think as life has happened, is the wisdom of life is in those questions, right? And when you ask that question to, I'll just repeat what you just said, basically said is look for honest feedback. The problem is most of us have built a life around us where we don't give the space for honest feedback. Because when somebody gives an, either they don't know how to give feedback, possible, but I think the bigger problem is we don't know how to receive feedback yeah, because it honestly, doesn't matter how they give the feedback. It's are we receiving it in a way that the person opens up and tells you the truth? Because if you're going to lash out on them after the first statement, they say this is wrong with you. Of course, that's not the right way to give the feedback, but that's OK. But at least they're opening up. And if their first reaction is I hate you and you run away from that room because how dare you say that about me and you become defensive, the whole beauty of that question is gone. 
Yeah, and what you have to understand is what they're saying may be really hurtful to you in any way critical, right? Mm -hmm. So if we're asking for honest <clears throat> feedback, we're probably just not asking them to say we're the greatest person in the world, Correct. They everything about us, you know, Correct. this isn't what we're asking. We're asking them to say, are there areas I could improve? Are there right. things about me, our relationship that you think could be better? And if we're asking that, we have to look beyond how they say it to what they're trying to get. Trying to say, so yeah. they may be saying things that are hurtful. They may even be saying it in the wrong way. Like there's a problem with you. You know, this, yeah. this what you do drives, I don't think is very considered or that's really annoying. They could be saying it in that way, but we have to say, why are they saying it? Well, they're saying it one, because I asked it. And number two, they're saying it because they want a better relationship. They want a better because relationship. Because they yeah. want our relationship to change and become better. Otherwise, they wouldn't even be with me. Right. They wouldn't be sitting here with me having even this conversation or even when they're mad yelling at me. When people are yelling at you, what they're telling you is that they are invested in this relationship and they want it to change Yeah. and they want it to become better. And in order for us as human beings to have those better relationships, we have to listen. We can't shut those yeah. conversations down. If we shut them down, if we cut off, as soon as they get difficult, we cut them off. We are never giving ourselves a chance to have a better relationship with that person. Correct. And it's sad, right? But a yeah. lot of us do that because we're defending ourselves, right? <laughs> we feel, Correct. We feel we're vulnerable and we have to defend ourselves. Wow. Well, this essence, is why. Essence, yeah. In essence, we're too weak. Like we're too we weak. Are. To take, all of us to, are. Yeah. yeah. All of us are. <clears throat> and so... What we have to understand is that being able to take this criticism and being able to look at it from a different perspective and then being able to actually act upon it is strength. It's not weakness, right? It's yeah. strength. And Correct. it's hard to get there. It's hard for all of us. <laughs> yeah. Steve, this is why I love podcasting, man. Where else will I have this conversation? <laughs> <laughs> no, this is amazing, man. This is amazing. I would call it wisdom and make it cliche. I think it's a lot of life experiences, right? And everyone has their own perspective. Everyone has their own. This is where the podcasting is great because you get to hear multiple perspectives and yeah, no and one's perspective it. is I right. I wouldn't be talking about this if it weren't for you. It's our conversation, right? It's like, our conversation. Talk, Correct. Like usually on my podcast, I'm talking about how to become an entrepreneur. How do you raise right. capital? How do you do all these practical things? You're asking me more philosophical questions, which I love, by the way. Um, because that's who you yeah. are, right? As a founder, people yeah. can teach you how to raise capital. No one's going to tell you how to become a better founder. And that's all in the mindset. It's all in the mindset. And like you, I'm a person who lives to discover, to learn, to right. grow. And it isn't just about getting more money. There's lots of ways to get more money. There's, Easier uh, ways to get more money. <laughs> yes. And it's fine. I want to be financially successful. But to me, that isn't the end goal. And that's not what makes a happy life. Yeah. Well, Steve, we can talk. It seems like you and I can <laughs> riff rap on this for the entire life. But I want to respect the time and also the duration of the episode. So people can derive value from that. I really, really appreciate your conversation and your time there. Let's end the show with two questions. The first question is, I know you've lived a very rich life and amazing experiences, all up, not all ups, some down, some ups, the normal normality of the life, but what would be one insight you would give to your 20-year-old self if you were to go back, like your kids probably on their 20s right now, early 20s, if they just found the job, what's one insight you'll share with them if they listen to you? So the one insight would be Everything you think is a big problem in your 20s, I can guarantee you will look back and yeah. you won't. Most of the stuff we get all worked up about, we're all stressed about. We don't even remember a year later, let right. alone 20 years later. Like we just don't yeah. even have any concept that that was an issue for us. So, to everybody, whenever you're getting stressed, whenever you think it's the end of the world, I guarantee you it's not. <laughs> Not, yeah, <laughs> more than likely, yeah. And if it is, it's the end of the world. There's nothing you can do about it, right? The world's over. If you're not facing imminent death, you and your family members, remember, you're going to bounce back from this. It's going to be fine. That's what I would have told myself because I think I put myself through a lot more anxiety than I had mm -hmm. to go through. I think it's well said. Most of us do, right? Because it's kind of like funny. I was talking to somebody yesterday or maybe day before. I can't remember when I was talking to It's another podcast episode where... It's the dichotomy we live in. We all think in our 20s, we have a long life, but somehow yeah. the problems have to be resolved like today. 
we think we're immortal and we'll never die but yeah. oh my god my life's going to end if this doesn't happen in my life right, right, uh, it's right, kind of right, like this right, dichotomy which is interesting right. am i successful am i not my first job i'm not making 150k i'm a failure yeah. whatever that amount is so that's interesting now the second question is which is a little bit broader perspective steve what's your one wish and desire for humanity to migrate towards in the next few years so we're at a very interesting <clears throat> point i write a lot about this in i did a book on ai called the five forces and i think we have to understand especially with artificial intelligence and humanity itself these machines ai is now capable of understanding who we really are what our motivations are mm. why we act better than we can because like mm. i said we're delusional and it's looking at real right. data right? right it has algorithms that are pattern matching machines just like our brains so ai can start to predict what we will do better than we can ai can start to make mm. decisions better than we can because it process vastly more data we have to figure out what is the right way to use these machines to enhance our lives right and what is the wrong way do we want to delegate and i can do a whole another talk on this all of our decision making to these ultra smart machines which is the direction we're headed mm-hmm. or how can we make decisions with them that are truly better for us without yeah. them becoming a crutch and also how can we build machines that are truly empathetic to human needs human suffering is this even possible these are the great challenges we face as humanity see this is amazing and we will do another one you know that you're not getting off the hook easy now you're stuck with me see <laughs> this is great that. thank you again for sharing your insights if people want to get in touch with you learning more about your work looking at the books you have where can they find it couple places so if you want to just contact me uh, my nickname is captain hoff captain h o f f dot com you can go there contact me my company is founder space so if you want to leap into doing a startup go to founder space dot com and i'm on all the social networks so you can find me there just search for captain hoff or founders that's awesome man steve thank you once again buddy well we're getting you again so don't worry i won't start another topic right now because we're going to talk for another half an hour <laughs> we have to end this one all right thank you steve Take care, buddy. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. If you got value from this episode, you might consider sharing this content with a friend. But most importantly, be sure to take action on what you've learned. One way you can take the next step is to connect directly with Socket on an investor call. That link is waiting for you in the show notes below. The content of this podcast is for informational purposes only. Please consult your own advisors when making any investment decisions. Keep listening. We'll see you on the next episode.